Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Richard Vetter. Dr. Vetter is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and uh, the Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Economics at Ohio University. He is also the founding director uh, of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity in Washington, D.C. He's the author of numerous books, most recently, Restoring the Promise, Higher Education in America. Dr. Vetter, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be with you. I, it is so great to see you again. I know our paths crossed a couple years ago at a debate tournament, and I have enjoyed reading your, your Forbes columns uh, ever since then. I wonder if we could start our conversation today. Uh, could you tell us, I know you recently wrote uh, a, a blog for Forbes about Mills College. What, what's the story? What's going on with, with Mills College? Well, Mills College was founded in the middle of the 19th century as a woman's college. It affected was the first women's college, I believe, west of the Mississippi River, and it had a, an honorable and decent, rep, a decent, honorable, pretty good reputation as a college throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. But somewhere along the lines, it, it decided that it wanted to uh, adapt to a, a highly progressive model where they uh, were uh, political activism uh, uh, reigned and where there was a, a rather limited amount of what I would call intellectual diversity uh, where uh, some ideas were suppressed or uh, seemingly were suppressed and lo and behold no surprise to me but some surprise to people at Mills enrollments at some point started falling and so at one time they uh, had, if you count all their enrollments and they had some graduate programs as well, they had around 1,300, 1,400 students, I think. And then the numbers started sliding to well below 1,000. Uh, counting the, the graduate students, only about 600 in the undergraduate program, which for a school that was uh, had built a campus for a larger number of students, and had no doubt some financial obligations associated with that, a debt and so forth. Uh, and uh, moreover, the alumni were getting a little un unhappy uh, because the reputation of Mills was sliding. Uh, they had a big debate whether to take men in. That is something that many women's colleges did. There's nothing particularly unusual about that. but they became, as, as I said in my Forbes, I think my headline was something like, uh, uh, being woke means going broke uh, <laughs> for Mills College. And that's exactly what happened. They were running out of money, uh, running out of ability to run. It's got a gorgeous campus in Oakland, California, very nice, beautiful campus, over 100 acres which in, a, uh, in the Bay uh, region 100 acres of land alone is a worth a fortune and uh so uh the other day since even since i wrote the call a column northeastern university uh uh took a, a sort of has agreed i guess to take it over uh which i find amusing from, from a school that is hardly uh it isn't terribly northern and it's certainly not eastern oakland california that has now become part of the uh, Northeastern system. They've, they have uh, sort of opening up a series of branch campuses, I guess you would say. So that's what happened to Mills. Uh, they ignored the basics. They ignored uh, students learning under the normal uh, uh, sets of uh, premises, uh, the, uh, abandoning the general education requirements, uh, courses in, uh, 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 that are uh, in philosophy in my field of economics. Some, they still maintain some foreign languages, but essentially it became a, a, a campus for a political activism. And there, there, there isn't that much market, particularly when the graduates were having a heck of a time getting jobs. Employers want people who have marketable skills or at least have uh, a good sense of what the world is about in a balanced, uh, broad sense. Mm -hmm. uh, they want a, 
if a school that offers a good liberal education that is unbiased and wide spread in the coverage of courses and so forth. And all of that went bye-bye at Wills Mills. So Mills went bye-bye and maybe or may not be resurrected. I don't know. I guess the time will tell under this new arrangement with Northeastern, but it will be a shadow of its former self. Well, that is, that is fascinating. I'll, I'll confess, part of me is sad to hear about a school that has been around for over 100 years, no longer being there. Uh, but I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, I, I wonder, I'm curious what your thoughts about how widespread that kind of phenomenon is, in part because my, my job took a bit of a change since last our paths crossed. And last year, I was my school's college counselor. And I, I got the, uh, to walk 39 seniors through the process of applying and they got into some great schools. And then we had several difficult conversations about sticker shock. And yeah. about even I'm not that old. I, was, I graduated from undergrad in 2011. And even in uh, a decade, uh, cost for, when I was a Hillsdale College graduate and tuition room and board has gone up by about $12,000 since I graduated there. And, but my students keep coming to me with like, 50, 60, $70,000 tuition room and board packages. And I, I'm having trouble understanding how can a school, like I assume Mills is kind of on par with that. How can a school charge so much for their goods and services? And yet the message that seems to be pretty common is that colleges always claim to be broke. So like help, help, how, how, all that, like help, help me understand the, the, the collegiate landscape from where you're sitting. Well, uh, I, by the way, I go back a little further than you. I uh, uh, I could joke and say that I uh, was teaching when you were minus 20. Uh, that is <laughs> 20 years before you were born. Uh, and I would not be telling the, uh, will not be telling a falsehood. I'd be telling you the truth. Uh, the <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why the cost of college has gone up, but the main reason tuition fees have gone up over the years is because the colleges could get away with it. And although there's a lot of factors at work, the single biggest culprit that I think that has led to astronomical increases in fees has been the federal government's intervention in the market system by providing so-called student loans. I say so-called student loans because now, in recognition of the enormous burden so many students have, the uh, Biden administration right now and uh, is increasingly trying to forgive those loans and say, "Oh, well, uh, you don't have to pay them back. Uh, you know, it's just a mere one and a half trillion dollar, one point six trillion dollars of of debt that uh, uh, the taxpayers will be left to pay." Uh, the burden will fall on the taxpayers if people do not pay them back. In, a, in an economy, by the way, and I'll put my economics hat on briefly, where we are already uh, flirting with major danger uh, because of the rampant borrowing and excessive spending and the Federal Reserve dropping money out of airplanes. They, they don't literally drop money out of airplanes, but they might as well. It's, it felt like it, a random $2,400 showed up in my wife and my bank account. It was like free money. It was great. Yeah, no, I hope you have That's a lot of fun with it, Josh. Uh, <laughs> enjoy while you still can. I, uh, you, you might want to, I don't, I, I won't even begin to tell you what you ought to do with it, but uh, it yeah. is. I, I, I enjoy the irony because, of course, Hillsdale does not take any federal loans, but yeah, no. uh, and there that's were no strings attached with this money. So I paid off our, we paid off our last student loan with uh, federal money that just appeared out of nowhere. So we, well, that, uh, have that's now, great. I'm glad you paid it off. And off of, it's amazing yeah. if you go to Hillsdale, Michigan and visit Hillsdale College, as I did right at the very beginning of the pandemic, it seems to be a fairly prosperous place. And somehow it, it 
got along without all this federal money and has gotten along pretty well. Beautiful new chapel there, for example, and uh, other buildings. And it's a great school. You know, I think that might connect to some of what you were saying earlier, because part of what Hillsdale's done very well under Larry Arn's leadership is really drill down into what I think a lot of what I think was implied when you said you called them the basics earlier, of like the, yeah. what a college should do, teach classes, give kids skills, help them demonstrate knowledge that they've learned, and then have a really strong job placement record. Um, Hillsdale is perhaps a little more ironic because they I remember sitting in uh, freshman orientation and David Whalen told us, don't think about jobs. You come to college to study and to learn all kinds of stuff. And if you do it right, you'll get all kinds of amazing job opportunities. And Hillsdale has an amazing job placement rate for a liberal arts college that does not do a lot of intentional specific career stuff. Sure. I think, I think their success has a lot to do with them cultivating a donor base uh, because and they can do that because they know what their mission is. I'm not sure that the Contemporary Academy really has a clear picture of what their mission is. Is that, would you agree with that? No, I would completely concur. Uh, Schools are aimless on their mission. They are making things up as they go along. They're adopting uh, ideologies, uh, becoming very ideological. They are abandoning the, the most precious form of diversity the most precious form of diversity is diversity of ideas. Yeah, uh, to me, having students that have different ideas and from different backgrounds is probably more important than the color of their skin or their uh, sexual preferences or all these other things that colleges spend so much time worrying about and talking about and hiring a bureaucracy uh, you uh, went to school in the state of Michigan, the University of Michigan, which is a very distinguished uh, public university, I'm the first to admit, uh, has somewhere now in excess of 100 employees whose job it is to uh, check up on the race and the uh, sexual preferences and all these other non-academic attributes of their student body. And I think that is absolutely sinful uh, and, and costly and wasteful and of course oh. raises tuition fees for the students. Just to make sure I understood that correctly, you said it's University of Michigan, that's a hundred employees who are kind of constantly checking and measuring the ethnic, racial and sexual diversity of their student body. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's about right. You know, the Those are salaried, <laughs> benefited employees. Yeah, I, I calculated jobs. there's a professor at the University of Michigan at Flint who is actually a very good professor named Mark Perry. And Mark Perry, uh, uh, you, you might want to check his, his, him out because he has written some interesting things. He's an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a good think tank in DC, one that I've had some association with. And Mark Perry has the precise numbers. And of course they change. Sure. The numbers I'm citing are a year or so old. They're not precisely right. And I've seen similar statistics uh, for other schools. Uh, Michigan's great uh, athletic rival is Ohio State University. And not to be outdone by Michigan, I think they're getting up close to 100 uh, people and what uh, they might what we sometimes call the diversity bureaucracy or the affirmative old name was affirmative action and it's to me somewhat arguable whether there ought to be anyone in, in that area it's to me somewhat arguable whether we should even ask for race information on application form who cares what the race of someone is we're Will they fit into the university or college community? Will they add, can contribute to that community? Will they benefit from the learning that they get there? Those are the critical issues. It's not the color of your skin or, or uh, it's the, as Martin Luther King said, it's the content of your character that counts mm. for more. And yet we've abandoned that at higher ed. That's not the only reason why costs have risen, but it's a contributing factor. 
uh, uh, academics when they get together. You get, uh, I always said, pick 50 professors at random by lottery from across the United States, gather them together in a, uh, a room and where they can drink wine and eat cheese or do whatever yolk professors do and uh, let them chat with one another. Within 10 minutes, they all be complaining about administrative bloat and the growth in non-academic staff. And <clears throat> the numbers bear it out. At one time, about half the staff on most college campuses were professors. The other half were we always needed people in the dormitories. We needed people to mow the grass. We needed presidents and some administrative staff. We always needed some of that, of course. And uh, in residential schools like, like Hillsdale, uh, uh, you, you need quite a bit of residential staff to deal with uh, the, the non purely academic aspects of the learning experience. But now the ratio, instead of being 50% one professor or one administrator is closer to two administrators for every faculty. So at a typical school, uh, maybe a third of the employees at the most are teachers. Uh, and for every teacher, there's two non-teachers. And, you know, we have employees in all areas of life, uh, uh, in athletics, in uh, affirmative action, I mentioned, but assistant deans, associate provosts, chiefs of staff. 50 years ago, if you ask a colleague, well, tell me how many chiefs of staff you have, they would say none. What's a chief of staff? You gotta have, that's someone who sort of oversees employees uh, who work for the big shop, the top administrator. And uh, no one had much of a staff. Maybe there'd be two people, uh, a president of the university at a, a liberal arts college, a secretary to that president, and maybe one other sort of a administrative assistant. N now, the, even at the liberal arts colleges, there will be uh, a, a larger staff than that. I expect even that would be true at Hillsdale, and uh, which is a school I greatly admire. But uh, so anyway, I've, that, that's a, a subject of concern. If I'm counting correctly, that's, a, that's three reasons so far. That's uh, governmental interference in the market. That's the, uh, what you call the uh, diversity profession or uh, professionals. And then there's administrative bloat. Are those, would you list those? I mean, uh, would you add anything to those or those? Well, kind of it's some, you know, it, it does vary some from school to school. Some schools, and I happen to be at one of those, has massive, subsidies of intercollegiate athletics. Uh, they, uh, my school spends about $27 million a year uh, on college sports. It takes in maybe $6 million in revenue from uh, TV uh, stations who are broadcasting games, from sell of tickets, uh, sweatshirts, and those kind of things. So they lose over 20 million a year. We have fewer than 20,000 students on my campus. So that's over a thousand dollars per student. And then you, if you were to go out and survey the students and say, hey, aren't you glad you've got all these intercollegiate sports? You'd be amazed at the percentage of say, well, that, I guess that's okay, but I don't ever go to the games. Uh, 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 you know, I rather stay in my dorm and, uh, you know, uh, play whatever, I don't know, uh, video games or whatever, or, or God forbid, go to the library and study. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 occasionally a student will be seen in the library. And uh, so that's another one. And, and, and you know, there, I could go on and on, but those are, are good examples. Uh, another thing, uh, Josh, and I, I don't want to give a, a soliloquy here along, you know, Abraham Lincoln gave the ad Batters Group address in three minutes and 20 seconds. And we've talked a heck of a lot longer than that and not been quite as profound, but uh, the, uh, I'm told that I I wasn't there. I'm an old guy, but I was not in Gettysburg in 1863. 
Um, but there, they're just a litany of expenses. The typical campus is abandoned at least three months a year in the summer. Uh, even Hillsdale College, that is more or less true. Uh, you know, there may be some summer programs and a few things going on. They try to have some activities, uh, but for about four months a year, because you have a month usually around the Christmas time or uh, between semesters or quarters uh, breaks. So you have, uh, we don't work terribly hard in higher ed. We claim we do, but us professors, uh, we, 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 most of us keep occupied, but so we're four months of the year, the college campus is empty. We teach uh, increasingly at the mantra at uh, large universities is we have reduced teaching loads so we can get more research out of our faculty. That's been a trend in the last 50 years. So at, at a, a good quality state university, a professor probably teaches two courses each term, maybe six hours a week in the classroom, spends another eight or nine hours a week with students in one way or the other, sometimes a little more than that. Maybe if you stretch things, you get 20 hours related to the academic function. And that's only for eight or nine months of the year. Who knows where they are in the summer uh, uh, at, at most schools. Uh, and so we don't utilize our resources to full capacity. A lot of colleges these days, it's, it's considered sinful to teach on Fridays anymore. Uh, certainly on Saturdays, when I started teaching, we had some students taking classes on Saturday mornings so that we fully utilized our classroom capacity. And uh, no, if you, it would be laughable to even think of teaching on Saturdays these days. Uh, so we have uh, capacity, we have problems with under utilization of our human resources, our capital resources, et cetera. So that is, I find that fascinating because I'm hearing that from the, for, I mean, I, I've always had a draw towards the, to higher education, but I've, I've not actually, my career has ended up being in uh, middle school and high school. And sure. I would say the opposite is the case for at the, at least the middle school and high school level where, I mean, uh, facilities are maximized and certainly, my goodness, I mean, I, I not to, uh, teachers at the at, uh, secondary level, secondary ed, that's the, usually the term for it. Secondary ed teachers are, we're, we're perfectly able to complain with the best of them. But I mean, my goodness, I don't know of people who work harder and put more hours in yeah. And at, at my school, I mean, it's not uncommon for, I mean, a standard workload is six classes where you teach six sections. You have two periods of the day that are for planning. Uh, but until you've spent really probably two years teaching those classes, uh, you take work home every day or you do work during on weekends. Yes, absolutely. But I have two children who are do exactly the same thing. One of them was a middle school teacher, the other a high school teacher. Uh, the high school teacher uh, was with me today and she spent half the day grading. Uh, and I said, what are you grading for? You're not, there's no school. You know, well, I'm doing advanced, uh, uh, I'm grading for Scoring the AP. board for uh, AP. Uh, so they're pretty darn hardworking people. Uh, uh, and I would quite agree with you. So it is true. And the, the, the idea is, well, we're doing research. And I must admit, I did a lot of research over the years. I have a couple hundred uh, journal articles and uh, much, uh, several, I don't know, seven, eight books, et cetera. But when you think about it, you look, well, how many people read that stuff? Uh, and it's embarrassing. Oh, it's so depressing. It's embarrassing. Uh, now, some of it is important. Research is important for the human condition to advance uh, our stock of human knowledge, or what us economists call human capital. It, there, it is you know, research does serve a useful function, but 
maybe we kind of have gone overboard. There were a thousand articles a year written about William Shakespeare over a 20 year period around, I think the day, roughly 1990 to 2010. Uh, that's three a day, three papers a day on Shakespeare. Now I think Shakespeare was a spectacularly important person. Uh, I love Shakespeare. Uh, I think maybe he was the greatest writer in the English language that ever lived. But does that, what new can you say about Shakespeare three times a day, once a year maybe, or 10 times a year maybe, or maybe 50 times a year, but a thousand papers on Shakespeare? And you go and you research, well, how often have those been cited by other people? Eh, typically zero times, sometimes once, uh, is it really worth uh, uh, having a low teaching load for that? Uh, maybe we should teach smaller classes, more classes, uh, reach out to students, spend more time advising them. That's what liberal arts colleges typically do rather well. Uh, they usually have a somewhat higher teaching loads too. Uh, so they, instead of teaching two classes, they will teach three because the research expectations are smaller. And sometimes they'll even teach four, uh, uh, but it's a problem. So really then it would, I'm hearing in that, that it would be a, well, it would be a difficult, I assume difficult substance of change, but it would be a very substance of change if the, I mean, if honestly, if research expectations were vastly lowered and teaching expectations were increased. I mean, it's like right now, my understanding of the of uh, I mean, of the higher ed as a as a field. I mean, it's still the publish or perish is the phrase I've heard a lot. And my friends who are applying for entry level associate professor jobs, I mean, they uh, they've sent me some of the applications. I mean, the applications they all expect you to have already published in the leading fields or in leading journals in your field. Which I I, I also I'm like I've never understood how you met, how you're supposed to like write a dissertation, work through grad school, and somehow also be in the top journal in your field as a 26 year old. Like that just seems yeah. ridiculous in and, a way. But, and, and it is demanding and it's very uh, uh, difficult for the young people who want to crack the, the, the top ranks of academia to get ahead. That's actually, and a lot of those people do work long hours because they're writing articles for the Journal of Last Resort, or whatever you want to call the journal, uh, and uh, that is true. But again, uh, I tend to look at things in cost-benefit terms. There are benefits to articles. The, the, certainly, academic research has improved the human condition in many ways. Uh, one of my best friends has a patent for uh, uh, with Pfizer. Uh, for the, a drug that has helped many, many people dealing with a, a, a medical problem. Uh, and that, that's a kind of a nice thing that happens with the, uh, in the academy. So a lot of research actually is useful, but for every useful uh, piece of research, there are 10 others that are not so useful. And so we've gotten a little out of, uh, it's gotten out of control. and. Uh, we have to consider the cost. Uh, you know, almost anything a human being in America buys today is cheaper than it was 50 years ago in the sense that it may cost more dollars. It surely costs more dollars. But our incomes have gone up commensurate with that. Indeed, more so. It takes fewer hours of work to buy a loaf of bread today than it did in 1950 or a banana or a... Uh, uh, most things that we consume, airplane travel. Uh, higher ed's the one great exception. It's actually a bigger burden on middle on families to pay for college today than it was 50 years ago. And the, uh, the only other thing that rivals that is healthcare. But even in healthcare, you can make the case, well, there have been some advances and there have been some improvements. And people are, uh, in spite of uh, the crazy behavior of human beings, 
uh, which often shortens their lives, on the average, they've been uh, uh, growing older. Uh, life expectancies have gone up generally over time. Not so much the last two or three years, but over the long haul. And uh, so maybe that extra money we're spending on health care is money well spent, possibly. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but that's a, at least something I would uh, entertain. But I'm not so sure I would say the same thing about higher ed. Are the kids learning more than they did 50 years ago? No, pretty sure. We give high grades. We have lower standards. So uh, students increasingly say, well, if I just sort of do the bare minimum, uh, I'll get B's and C's. Uh, that's okay. I'll graduate. I'll get a piece of paper that says I'm an educated human being. Whether you are or not is a debatable proposition. But that's the way a lot of kids think. Not all kids, but a fair percentage thing. And I don't blame them. Uh, 50 years ago, when I started teaching uh, freshmen, the, the grade I gave the most was C's, uh, mostly C's. And I probably gave more, I know I gave more D's and F's than I gave A's mm -hmm. uh, uh, in my early days of teaching. Today, if a professor gave uh, a huge number of D's and F's and no A's, uh, they, they might drop all the rules against firearms and let the local ROTC shoot the guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. I mean, it, well, uh, Dr. Vetter, let me ask you two more questions and we have to wrap this up. But yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I'm talking to oh, No, this is wonderful. I just like, I, uh, it's, it's, it's so rare to find somebody who can kind of look at college over the span of the past 50 years, but that's, that's, you've been in that, you've been in that game for long enough to give you that wider perspective, which is so helpful. Um, I am curious uh, just about your thoughts on uh, sort of what, in my mind, is the traditional argument about paying for college. And I, I, mean, I, I watch students kind of wrestle with this. I'm curious what you think. I mean, the, the argument that I've heard for years, uh, and I at least participated in some level of this, is that college debt is acceptable debt because you borrow to pay for college and you enter the market at a higher point in terms of like initial wages. And different, this, we had another debate resolution about this a couple of years ago, but uh, different studies come up with different numbers, but everybody tends to agree that college graduates make somewhere around a million dollars more than just high school graduates in terms of lifetime earnings potential. So I guess my question is this, in light of everything we've been talking about, uh, is the old argument about college debt being good debt, is that still, would you, does that still hold water or has the situation changed enough that that's no longer a solid argument? It is less true than it once was. Uh, it is true that, <laughs> excuse me, having a diploma does have a financial benefit for most college graduates. That is still true. It's less true though, the magnitude of the extra money you make going to college is not always what it used to be. I have a relative who uh, graduated from high school and is now in truck driving school. He went to school for a few months. He has graduated. He owes some money to pay for that schooling, but they said, pay us back from your earnings. What's his starting salary? I don't know, 70,000 a year or something like that. Coding academies, uh, the same. So there are options to the traditional college degree that are, are increasingly attractive to students who are, are not necessarily uh, undisciplined or poor uh, in their uh, academic aptitude, but who made a conscious decision. Another thing, of course, is a lot of kids take five or six years to graduate. Uh, a lot of another thing is 25% of those who enter college, uh, actually more than that, 35% of those who enter college don't graduate, four year college, don't graduate even in six years. So there's some risks associated with colleges. I think those risks tend to be understated. For the, a good student 
who was good in high school, uh, uh, did pretty well, was fairly uh, disciplined and uh, whatnot. College is usually uh, uh, still a, a, a decent investment, if you want to use that term. Uh, it, it, it still is. But the notion that it is universally a good investment and that everyone should go to college is, uh, I think, uh, increasingly suspect. And the enrollment figures show that students agree. There are 2 million fewer college students this fall than there were 10 years ago in 2011 expected. 2 million fewer. That's 10% roughly. Uh, so we are at a time when the American population, of course, is growing, not it's growing slowly, but it is growing. So the proportion of Americans who are actually in school at the college level has taken a pretty big dip. And so some people are starting to say, just say no to college. Now, for the average graduate of uh, a good uh, high school, like uh, the one you have been associated with, uh, of course, going to college is probably a good thing. Uh, but uh, I think people have to not just automatically assume, oh, we can go out and borrow all we want because it's pretty definite that we're going to be better off. And by the way, there are other ways we can finance college now besides federal student loans. There's things called the income share agreements, which I think are great. We don't have time to get into that, but it's it's cool. Oh, that's a that's that those those are helpful thoughts. Uh, well, uh, part of our show on the optimistic curmudgeon is looking for uh, sort of a curmudgeonly sense of reality, but also looking for hope. So I want to kind of close with uh, asking, uh, what what hope do you see for like where colleges are going? Do you, are we looking at a looming collapse and a rebirth of the collegiate space, or do you see a kind of a do you see course corrections, or uh, what 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 road forward do you see? Well. You know, I look at the private sector. Great American companies go broke. Eastman Kodak was a big thing 25 years ago. It's virtually non-existent now. It's, it's barely in existence. We have many other examples of that. We have what Joseph Schumpeter once called creative destruction in the in the business economy, where business, where the markets weed out the weak, the those are performing less well, those are performing, providing less useful services, and, but they're replaced by other companies. 25 years ago, people didn't know what Microsoft or Apple, they might have known what Microsoft or Apple were. They didn't know Facebook because it didn't even exist. They didn't know Google because it didn't exist. Uh, they didn't know Amazon because it didn't exist. So the same principle could apply in higher ed and in universities. We'll have some losers. The Mills colleges probably ought to go out of business because they're not providing a, a useful product for uh, uh, younger people. Uh, the Hillsdale colleges will probably still be around because somehow they figured out how to provide that product and do it in a sort of unorthodox way that sort of protects themselves in a sense uh, from some of the uh, uh, problems we have. So there'll be winners and losers, but things will evolve, they'll change. Uh, Americans have a great capacity uh, to innovate and change. And it might be more online. It might be more, you know, the, the, the exact nature of the change. I, I'm not sure I know. Uh, I, I think we need to get back to basics to some extent. We've lost a uh, sense of what uh, higher, uh, a higher education really is or should be. Uh, we have lowered our standards too much. We have too much great inflation. I could go on and on. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do have a capacity to bounce back. And I, I'm hopeful that that's true. I hope the government, uh, you know, sometimes when you uh, see light at the end of the tunnel, the government adds more tunnels. And uh, uh, 
And uh, I worry a little bit about that. But otherwise, I'm fair, uh, cautiously optimistic. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Vetter, thank you so much for uh, joining us on The Optimistic Curmudgeon today. Uh, where can people find and follow your work online? Well, uh, if you go to Forbes.com and look under my name, I think, uh, I write a weekly column for Forbes. I do a lot of other crazy things, uh, some of them not so crazy. Uh, I write for other outlets and uh, occasionally do radio, TV kind of things and whatnot. Uh, I'm told there's some interesting YouTube videos. Uh, I'm not a modern technology freak. As you know, I, we could barely get this show on today because of my ignorance. I still uh, appreciate you working through the tech though. I yeah, really, really enjoy uh, this conversation. So, you know, there are, but I, uh, I think the Forbes site is probably the best place to start. I write, I have quite a few pieces in the Wall Street Journal over the years, but uh, I think Forbes is a, I'm consistently on Forbes uh, saying something, sometimes rather outrageous things uh, in the, uh, in the view of many, but I say them anyway. Curmudgeonly, I might add, I love the reason I'm on this show. I love anything with the word curmudgeon in it because I think the world needs more curmudgeons. And I'm glad to see that you're promoting the art of curmudgeonry, if I can make up the word. And, uh, I had a favorite professor, one of my favorite professors at Hillsdale, is certainly a, uh, a curmudgeon. Uh, and I know um, uh, our, our mutual friend, Bob Luddy, uh, thinks of himself as a bit of a curmudgeon. And oh, he is. And I, I love Bob for the same. Bob and I are very much the same in that regard. He, and I have some friends at Hillsdale, too. Uh, we, could, we probably shouldn't be sitting here naming names, but I, uh, I have several friends at Hillsdale. Or there's, he, Bob, at least, is convinced that really it's, it's the curmudgeons who run the world. And if you... If you don't realize that, you're just out of step with reality. So yeah. talking to curmudgeons is always a fun, fun. Well, thing. yeah, the people who are successful in life are different. And being different means often, doesn't always, but often means being curmudgeonly. Uh, uh, means being different, at least. Okay. And sometimes different in a gruff, uh, unhumorous way and sometimes in a lovable way numerous way. There are different ways you can be curmudgeonly, but it, it's a, a cool thing to be. And Bob and I should, uh, next time I talk to him, I will suggest we form a society of curmudgeons or something. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Here we go. With t-shirts and mugs. All yeah, have stuff. the whole ball of wax. If you, if you happen to talk to him, you might tell him I uh, suggested that. I'll, I'll be sure to pass that on. Oh. Um, well, listeners, thank you for joining us today for our conversation about colleges, higher ed, curmudgeons, and uh, Mills College, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, this has been a, another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you like this episode, please feel free to leave us a five-star review, share it with your friends, help them get to know Dr. Vetter. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful.